Uh, so this was another painful chapter. There are um, a couple of things I just wanted to mention uh, before we, we uh, sort of begin discussion. Uh, the first, which is sort of revealing, is that uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, we can sort of detect the attitude of the church through by examining what happened in three of the major denominations. Uh, so the first is the Anglican Church, which didn't split into separate northern and southern groups. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, at their 1862 uh, convention, which was held in New York City, no southern delegates attended, and as a result, they conducted no business that of note and did nothing that might be polarizing or construed as polarizing so that everybody could come back, which they did at the next convention. The uh, Methodist church remained split and uh, the uh, pastoral letter of the bishops of the Mes Methodist Episcopal Church South said the abolition of the institution of domestic slavery in the United States does not affect the question that was prominent in our separation of 1844, nor is this the only difference or principal one between us and the Northern Methodist Church. We must express with regret our apprehension that a large portion, if not a majority, of Northern Methodists have become incurably radical. They teach for doctrine the commandments of men. They preach another gospel. They have incorporated social dogmas and political tests into their church creeds. They have gone on to impose conditions upon discipleship that Christ did not impose. Their pulpits are perverted to agitations and questions not healthful to personal piety but promotive of political and ecclesiastical discourse, discord. Preach Christ and him crucified. Do not preach politics. And then the Freedmen's Aid Society of the Methodist Church, which is the Northern branch of the Methodist Church, commented on their failed mission in uh, 1875. It must not be forgotten that the free men and citizens were emancipated in ignorance, degradation, and poverty in what a centuries of wrong and oppression have made them. And it is equally clear that the act of emancipation conferred no preparation for this new condition of life into which totally disqualified they have been thrust. But emancipation is not complete in itself. It presupposes and demands preparation. The nation has emancipated this people, but it, it has not done as its part, unless it pushes more vigorously the work of Christian education. And so the work of Christian education is identified as the, the critical missing component. And then a final remark on, on Catholicism, that uh, there was very little focus on the issue of slavery. Uh, but in place of slavery, there was a focus in the aftermath of the Civil War on uh, the heroism of Catholics on both, both sides. Um, also, the majority of Catholics were staunch Democrats, which meant that they supported the party that denied Blacks the right to vote, that imposed legal segregation, and that ignored the mounting racial violence against Blacks. And then also, segregation was practiced uh, in both the North and, and the South. Uh, pews were segregated in the South. 
um, blacks were entirely barred from some northern parishes, as well as from some Catholic schools and hospitals. And also, I don't know if anyone remembers, but Father Boo had mentioned at one point in one of his homilies that uh, an old uh, southern uh, black man, southern black man who was in one of his, his parishes uh, mentioned that during the period of segregation, there were separate altars in his church for whites and for blacks. Oh my God. Which um, is theologically very interesting. Theologically absolutely wrong. <laughs> well, well, at least I think so. Liturgically wrong. I don't know about theologically, but liturgically it's not right. Well, uh, no, it, it, it makes a major theological statement. Does, do, do, does anyone see the theological statement it makes? That there's a separate God for whites and a separate God for blacks. Oh, all right, that's my take. I may be well, I, wouldn't, I would go further than that. Christ is indivisible. Christ cannot be divided. So there you're can only God. be one altar. Right. So you're right about the separate God, but who is the separate God that could be worshipped at the other altar? Well, it depends on which one is worshiping at the right altar. <laughs> it's either the God of slavery or the God of the white people, right? <laughs> Who is the God of slavery and the God of the white people? No, what I'm saying is you, you said the one is, is the one altar is there, but who's worshiping, whose God is at the other? It depends on who's at the first altar. Christ, the first is, at, Christ the is at the altar of the oppressed. The, all right. Then at the other altar, the white people have put themselves as God. Mm. White supremacists have made themselves God. Or that's, that's possible. I would argue that at the second altar, Satan is being worshipped. Oh, okay. Well, when you put yourself in the place of God, you are worshiping Satan. So, yeah. Um. And next, next week, we'll read about Augustus Tolton, who was, who was mentioned in the next chapter, but he was the first black priest, or actually he was the first black priest who did not pass as a white person. There were two brothers who were ordained previously. Uh, but his case is interesting because he wasn't accepted to seminary in the United States. And uh, he had to be, he was sent to, to uh, Rome to study uh, in seminary and was expected to be assigned to Africa as a missionary, but probably as sort of an expression of displeasure at uh, racism and America was assigned as a priest in the United States in Illinois. So with that, um, I'm going to try to do a lot less talking since I seem to talk way too much. So there were there any sort of reactions or thoughts about this chapter before we sort of formally discuss focused questions? It was definitely a tougher chapter, right? The depiction of violence was really difficult. Yeah. I have a question just about the ranking of people. Um, the, the one section where the person was identified as like a one eighth African American, <laughs> or I think that was his status. And I just wondered, do people, I didn't, I was, that just shocked me that, you know, they're, do they have like papers or they were, I mean, how does that work? How do they, how do they know a person has, you know, a percentage? I, I just thought that was crazy because I haven't never heard that word. I mean, I know there was, um, 
anyway, does anyone, do you know how that works? No, no. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in some areas, mulattos were recognized as a, a distinct group. Uh, so those are people of mixed race. Uh, but I'm not sure that there's any real real basis given the prevalence of rape in in a rape of female slaves I, I don't you know I, I don't know um, at all that there's any real basis to know what proportion white or black or anything else anyone actually is regarding that Plessy verse, versus Ferguson, that part of the chapter? Oh, oh, for Plessy versus Ferguson. Yeah, I, I think he was he was one eighth black. And mm -hmm. yeah, it just I couldn't I, that so he, just is crazy. So I mean, he probably knew his heredity. And mm -hmm. so could establish that he was one eighth black. When I was reading the chapter, not so much the the violence parts, but more and more at the beginning, I guess toward, toward the middle of the chapter, they kept talking about how the Southerners. Well, first of all, they they did not change their attitude toward the black person at all. But secondly, there was this sort of. Um, ethereal lost cause you know the, the lost cause was was the uh, was the big thing and I, I there were a couple other terms for it and how the 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 women would um you know establish they started establishing met that may have been later but at some point they established you know the monuments and memorials and this and that and as i'm reading that what kept coming into my head was gone with the wind hmm. Uh huh. The, come with the wind after the war is over. That's what you have. You have all these women. They're they are considered delicate flowers, and they so they let they consider themselves delicate flowers. I mean, Scarlett O'Hara was really a one off, <laughs> but everybody else was. Oh, you know, don't rock the boat, and oh, be quiet now. Our men are off. We know where they're going, but we're not going to tell. You know, the Ku Klux Klan business, and in the in, that's the way it was in the movie, and it's it's sort of talks about that here mm -hmm. so i mean i know gone with the wind is supposed to be a, a horrible movie we shouldn't go see it because of the way it depicts blacks but and and i agree you know they made they made some blacks look like oh they were so happy to be doing what they were doing but there's a lot in that book that is so accurate according to what he's writing here the attitudes and the and the and so forth you know, so anyway, that's what kept going through my mind that they they actually de depicted that in in Gone with the Wind, how the women mm -hmm. and the men, and they just they may have been defeated, but you know that was just on paper, mm -hmm. not the way they're going to live it up. Oh, so since you brought up the lost cause, that's our first question. The Lost Cause narrative blends Civil War history along with Christian dogma to give uh, their losses, the, the Confederacy's losses, divine significance. What dangers does the Lost Cause narrative pose? And in what ways has it persisted to the present time? Well, it gives an excuse, that's for sure. It kind of puts it in a puts them in a in a negative box and also, it, it makes the Christians have an excuse, you know, to why they've segregated and why they're not accepting. Because they put it under the umbrella of the lost cause. I mean, that's mm -hmm. put them, yeah. What comes to my mind is Growing up, we used to consider it kind of a joke thing, but there was a saying, save your Confederate money, boys, the South will rise again, right? And that's what this is, you know? We, we may have be temporarily defeated, but sooner or later, 
And when it says here, what, darn, my eyes get all blurry. Um, the Civil War history loses divine signal. What dangers does a lost cause narrative pose? Well, first of all, it poses that, that they're living in, a, in a, a sense of, I mean, their reality is not reality. They're, they're living in a, a, a made up reality. And in today, in, you see it today in the white supremacist um, um, attitudes and so forth. Unfortunately, not just in the South, but through the whole, through the whole country. And, and, and the fact that as it services more and more, we never, we did never got to the point where we made black and other people of color totally equal. It never happened, civil war or no civil war. And something that's always, bought, no, hasn't always. In the last few years, it's bothered me about the civil war is Lincoln was way too kind. You know, oh yeah, let Lee take his horse and his men, they, they should just go home. Lee should have been strung up. So should have, um, his game name is escaping me now, but the president of the Confederacy and the vice president. Jefferson and Davis. Brother. I mean, that was treason. That was treason with a capital T. And they're living it. They were able to live this lost cause narrative because there were no consequences to them of note. And to this day, it's the same thing. Well, and I think it refocuses the argument. They're using the lost cause to claim that they're virtuous and um, they had this idyllic situation and it was just about their freedom. It was, I mean, that's what they're arguing is that the, the war was about their, their freedom to choose. And so it kind of sweeps the whole slavery issue under the rug. And I agree with Mary, I think, right? There's still, we still have um, very conservative people that, you know, the right to bear arms, it's just, it's all about our freedom. The right to not wear masks is about our freedom. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about us choosing because we are virtuous people. Right. Um, so one of the, 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 the element of, I mean, they're, they're clear, the, and clearly the, the divine, I mean, the divine, uh, the lost cause is closely paired with Christianity and, and particularly the fact that they had lost the Civil War was seen as being really a call to holiness and a call to renew your first love, which is Jesus, and to focus on personal holiness and on the path to salvation. So what's wrong with that? Everything. <laughs> Uh, what are the components of everything? Well, they don't have to follow the teachings of Jesus to make it to heaven. They just have to declare that they are righteous and they love Jesus or embrace him as their savior. They don't have to do good works. Let him into your heart. Right. So there's a lot lacking. There's definitely not any kind of love for neighbors you love yourself there's not you know any right. any kind of goodness behind that it's very much uh in the soul of fides tradition that you don't actually have to do anything D does everyone know what soul of fides is saved by faith alone Saved by faith alone, right? It's one of the foundational principles of the Protestant Reformation. The trouble, the, the little bit of trouble with that is that we are saved by faith alone. I mean, we are saved by faith, but you need to live that faith. And that's where they stop. They don't, right, we're we're, we're not them. saved by faith alone. Trent, it, it, it's so... It's, uh, it's helpful to read the the um, 
the um, the document on justification from the Council of Trent, since it offers a really brilliant attempt to summarize how salvation works. So the, the basic its basic argument is that salvation is or that, that the initial offer is a gift of grace from god right. that we through faith accept that grace and faith interact to drive us to commit good works yeah good works reinforces our faith a re our reinforcement of faith gives rise to uh endows us with greater grace the interaction of greater grace and our faith produces greater works that in turn produces greater grace more grace which drives us to greater faith which drives us and their interaction drives us to more works so we have a constant three-way interaction between faith grace and works right so that is the summation or the the, the condensation of, of Trent's sense of what how salvation works and, and the salvation, the message of salvation in the Bible. And I think it does a really brilliant job. So from that perspective, salvation by faith alone is is uh, bankrupt. I agree. I agree. But you can't earn your salvation. You can do all the work you want. If you don't have a good faith relationship and and so forth, you know, I mean, it, it's our salvation is a no, totally no, different you, God. You, you can't earn salvation, although, yeah. although Catholics are accused of thinking you can, but no theologian has ever argued that you can no but in the grade schools in the 40s and 50s that's what we were taught so you know that, that's <laughs> Which true. Is, thank god for the council came along and said no no let's get our ferrari straight here so yeah so related to the lost cause yes is are there any other comments on this question yeah just a quick thought thought mm -hmm. uh, the uh, myth seems to me that uh, nothing has really changed uh, through the years because uh, it is relevant up until now because it seems like faith on all religion is being used as a shield or as an excuse from what they committed the atrocities the inhumane treatment of people Mm -hmm. uh, inequality, bigotry, in all forms of evil deeds. And so faith is being used to shield. I'm right because this is my faith, even though obviously the wrong is there. It's still being committed up to this point. Uh, for example, the uh, other religions such as Islam does the same thing. The ISIS people. <laughs> so, you know, there's the paradox that I'm seeing here, you know. Right. Right. And right. Sheila, let me just, did you, were you the one that uh, sent or shared that video presentation from Barry University? Is that Sheila? Yeah, yes, she did. Mass Massingales? Yes, that was yeah. really yeah. very, very, an excellent. Amazing. Yeah, yeah it's it is it. super interesting. He had some yes. great ideas, I thought, too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you had a chance to watch it. I, haven't, I mean, there's I, some, I, I the intros he's... are pretty long, but it's worth, it's worth, uh, you know, working through it. I, he's just, yeah, he's a really, I've heard him speak before. So one of my co, my coworkers sent, told me about it. And then I thought I have to share with you. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's inspiring, but really, you know, he had some, I liked his concept of the relay. It's a relay race, right? I thought that was really like an, positive turn on it right yes yeah mm -hmm. but there was a lot yeah thank you a shield is a good a good description eddie 
So the next question, a basic principle is that history is written by the victors. Mm -hmm. One of the few historical exceptions appears to be the history of the Civil War. Why? Well, I'm going to just venture a guess here. This, so the Civil War, in my mind, just as I referred just a few minutes ago, it, what, the, the ending, the way it ended up, um, nobody was to blame. Everybody could go home. Now we're all going to be one country again. We mm -hmm. do. We do want you to stop treating the black people the way you've been treating them, though. There won't be any more slavery. And there was, there was the Reconstruction era, era and so forth like that. But we, we didn't. We didn't enforce the we the North did not enforce, did not kind of stamp. I don't mean stamp. What's the word I'm thinking? Validate that we won. You lost. You've got to change your ways totally. They never did that. Not really. You know. I mean, they didn't enforce it. And so, you know, it was just a spat between brothers. You know, brother against brothers. It, it sentimentalized a lot of the history, in my view is very sentimentalized and, mm -hmm. and 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 it's because they didn't say this was an act of treason you know what happens with treason you're at least going to do life in prison if not get thrown up there was never any of that so so why was that i mean consider you know the cost of the war the enormous number of lives lost right. in the war right uh, so, I mean, the, the sort of thing is really unprecedented, and yet we have history, the history of the Civil War being written by the losers instead of the victors. Right. And so traitors become virtuous, yeah. uh, people who are grossly immoral become heroes. So how, why was that? I think there's a similarity um, to some extent that played out with our recent uh, former president. You know, so the KKK became became, um, and then the birth of a nation, which promulgated the message of the KKK, was seriously embraced by Woodrow Wilson in the White House. She invited people over and over to view it and promoted it. And so I think that there was some um, fake news being shared that the black people are dangerous, are not capable of um, intelligent thought and are a threat. And then I think you also have, um, I just feel like there's so many layers to this. So there are also, with the you know the caste system that really existed on our economy and still exists so there's a threat suddenly with these um these laborers coming north and threatening jobs so suddenly you have the, the white people who are occupying you know the the, the lower jobs um in order that for, I'm not really saying this well, but in order for them to maintain their place in society, which is not the lowest caste, right? They have to have somebody in that. They have to relegate this, these other classes of people to below them, right? I just feel like there's so many um, factors at play here. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah, in many ways, I just feel like they were perceived as a threat to society as both the North and South knew it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It, it, it wasn't until really the post-World War II period, uh, and to a degree the World War II period, that there was a huge Black migration to the North. And, and part of the reason for that is that Blacks weren't welcome. There was also a desire for reconciliation and, and a desire to compromise. 
And you know, since the major issue that they're really divided, um, the irreconcilable issue that divided North and South was slavery and, and in a lot of ways the Southern way of life. That meant that after the Civil War was won by the North and lost by the South, that continued pressing was simply going to renew and reinforce the conflict. And so, you know, we sort of see I mean, that kind of approach is advocate or, you know, is sort of indicated by, by the Anglicans, uh, you know, the Northern Anglicans not conducting any real business in the absence of the South until they could be reunited and hopefully agree. You know, so that, that, that represents kind of a, a uh, sort of a, a moderate compromising position where you kind of look at what, what, look for the minimum of what can unite us and focus on that and forget what about what divides us, even though what divides us may be much greater than what unites us. You know, I'm just thinking, sitting here thinking, the way of Jesus would be the way of reconciliation, of, okay, we're, we've stopped fighting now, but we we want to put all that behind us and be brothers and sisters again. I mean, that is the Christian way. But somehow or other, if we had done, and of course it was mixed up, there was some, you know, recon reconstruction and all that. But if, if, if we hadn't done that, would that have been unchristian of the North to punish the leaders of the, of the Confederacy and the major generals and all that stuff? I mean, how does that play out? By, by not really, uh, that the worst, the most forceful thing we did was the Emancipation Proclamation. We, we freed the slaves. But that doesn't mean that the South didn't find ways of making them be just about in the same condition, except that technically they were free. They were sharecroppers, they were, you know, and so forth and all that. But how does that work? I mean, Jesus says, forgive, you know, forgive your brother and stuff. So how, how do you reconcile that? And maybe that's what was playing into it. And, and even the Anglican in the North, you know, that their, their attitude was, we, we want to reconcile with, with them. But if that means giving up true Christian values, that's not good either. Well, I mean, a, a problem is that forgiveness does not mean acceptance. Agreed. And so, so the basic problem, I mean, it's, it's one thing to forgive, but it's not acceptable to compromise basic principles. Jesus forgave, but he never retracted his condemnation of the, the temple. Yeah. And his cleansing of the temple has been romanticized in especially in the last millennia or so of Christian history. But the issue really wasn't that, you know, Jesus was sort of cleansing the temple. He was performing a prophetic action that announced its irrelevance and its demise. So in some sense, that's a pronunciation of the death of the existing religious system, which was he condemned because it had completely lost God, substituted um, 
human ambition and human interpretation of, of uh, Torah and of God's law and had completely made God incidental. So, so I mean, at the same time, that's a difficult question. At what point do compromises compromise everything? Mm -hmm. At what point are, in fact, the differences irreconcilable where, you know, and, and we've reached a point that you know, reconciling means accepting a position that is contrary to the gospel. And, and that's, a, I mean, that is a really difficult question. That's a really difficult question for, you know, the church today as we're very, very divided into uh, you know, mm -hmm. conservative Catholics and um, non-conservative Catholics or progressive Catholics or, um, you know, however we would like to describe uh, non-conservative Catholics. I think there's also an issue with um, racism was institutionalized pretty quickly. You know, President Johnson was not a fan of equity, right? And so with the um, passage of the 13th Amendment that although it declared all people are free, um, there was such a caveat allowing for um, criminals to become essentially slaves. Mm -hmm. um, it allowed this to perpetuate and it was easy for people in the North um, to say, but we've got this 13th Amendment. Everybody's free. Everybody has freedom. And then kind of just ignore the fact that or perhaps not realize um, that the South was essentially given away to, to perpetuate slavery, um, which kept people of color down, um, right? And then the just the the reason to easily put people in jail so that you could still have your um, slave labor. It just, I mean, that's that's not gone away. Right. Right. And the, um, yeah. I have a question. Well, what is was the percentage of the slaves in the north versus the south? I mean, it was much higher in the south, but I don't know, like proportionally, would did that have any influence on how things progressed, or that's just a lame excuse? Yeah, I mean, slavery really wasn't very widespread or a major part of of the northern economy. Uh, the North did not depend on, on slavery, particularly. The, um, the vagrancy laws were, you know, sort of part of it, but it, there was, uh, you know, so, Remember that, that Sherman had set aside, in Sherman's march, he had set aside a large chunk of land that was going to be given to freed slaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was taken back and then returned to the slave owners. So essential to, and we saw in, in the, the uh, you know, that document from the, uh, the quotation I read from the uh, Methodist Church mm. that uh, they had considered most of their mission a failure because people weren't ready for supposedly for emancipation. That you know the soil had to be prepared and and uh, you know so the, the basic reality is that when if you simply give somebody freedom 
in the midst of you know, a set of institutions that oppress them without giving them the means to survive independently of those institutions, you have accomplished nothing. And so what needed to be done was that people needed to be given land, they needed to be given money, they needed to be given something. And there's this kind of uh, Marxist joke, I guess, that the bourgeoisie will give you everything that doesn't cost them anything. And we see that here. You can have your freedom, but that means you know, that many people have to freed slaves now become sharecroppers or tenant farmers mm -hmm. or wage laborers at low pay. And then if they try to go somewhere, they get arrested and end up being working for free. So there's this um so fundamentally i mean we have reconciliation we also have pervasive racism in the north as well as in the south and the result of all of this and not wanting to and a desire to compromise is that history is written by the losers and uh, and it's shocking when history is written by the losers. I mean, if you, if you uh, there, there's an attempt to sort of rewrite modern, the history of Christianity um, from the viewpoint of the losers, if anyone has paid any attention to some of the, the more recent work of kind of the liberal German school and uh, and the results are laughable, um, would be laughable if they weren't you know, so harmful. Uh, and this similarly is, would be laughable if it weren't so harmful. So I'm, I'm thinking of my experience of studying in school, the Civil War. And I guess, I mean, would this be an example that Lee and, and um, Grant, when when you're reading the history book and all, they're sort of treated on the same level. You know. That, that Grant, kind of, is, Grant, is, uh, Grant is treated a bit worse. He was, he was well, an alcoholic. He was, you know, a chronic well, drunk. I, I, I know. I, I didn't really mean personal habits. I mean, the fact that they were generals, you know, the main generals of two opposing forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, it, but the thing is, Grant was a drunk and Lee book. was a very moral, upstanding person. Well, I know that, and I know Grant was kind of really iffy, but uh, talking strictly about their generalship, their, their part in the war, they were treated, when, when you read it, when I was taught about it, I didn't see that Lee, even though he lost, I did not see him as a traitor to the country or right. uh, that, that he had suffered any consequences. And what's worse, it didn't bother me. Of course, I mean, I was a child, I was a young, you know, teen, whatever, but never, it never bothered me. It was like, we all made up and we're all happy together, except of course for the black people, because you know, that was iffy, but at least they're free, you know, like you're saying, at least they're free. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It was a dispute among gentlemen that cost, however, 60,000 lives or so. Mm -hmm. If that's the number, I don't remember. And I'm thinking about Gettysburg too. Not to take away from the fact that, uh, you know, when, when a soldier is fighting and when he does brave things, he does brave things, regardless of what the cause happens to be, you, you, if you can divest that one from the other. But when you read the history of the Battle of Gettysburg, it really is written 
as the history of a battle. None of the implications of, I mean, it, it's it really, it's, it's written, you know, Pickett's charge was just as wonderful as something similar on the right, on, on the northern mm -hmm. side, which escapes me at the moment. But I'm just thinking about that. It, and oh, well, it's too bad. Well, we stopped Lee from getting into Pennsylvania, but not we stopped Lee from getting into Pennsylvania and so that if he won, slavery would be spread throughout the country or words of that effect. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It's all right. just cut and dried. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a tendency in military history to ignore. Um, it's also a tendency in narrative history, you know, to ignore the issues and to focus on to see military history as purely military, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to see narrative history as these interesting facts and stuff. Um, and none of that is actually history. None of that, from the viewpoint of at least an analytical historian, right. none of it is right. e even remotely of interest. So next our Southern Monuments. I'll read the question. Most of our fine Southern Monuments, as twice impeached former President Trump called them, were erected from 1900 to 1920 and again from 1950. To 1960. There are three questions. What is the significance of these monuments and what is their relevance for today? Can you think of a hypothetical historical equivalent, hypothetical because such monuments were never built, that we can compare the construction and defense of Southern monuments to? And finally, are there any other monuments in America whose construction and defense is similarly oppressive? Ron, before before we go there, can can I make a short comment? What, Certainly. What, what Mary said about Gettysburg. Uh huh. It's way back in high school. Uh, we were required to uh, do a speech before you graduate from high school, which is a Jesuit run high school, and they had us memorize the Gettysburg Address by. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I memorized that. Uh, four score and seven years ago. I, right. I never knew the significance of Gettysburg until I came here in the U.S. when I was 18 years old. Uh -huh. That the profound impact of Gettysburg to the American people. Now I've uh, learned so much about, that's why I'm so interested in attending this, this seminar. Uh -huh. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Yeah. Sorry for interjecting. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah, so our monuments, our fine Southern monuments, what is their significance? Well, you have the losers acting like victors. You don't, you don't, in, in Nazi Germany, you didn't see them erecting statues to Hitler and Himmler because they were the, the you know, the defeated people. But in the United States after the Civil War, you had you know, Glee and, and Stonewall Jackson and all of them. And you had the ordinary Confederate soldier. I think just about every town or most towns, if they could afford it, you had a statue to the Confederate soldier, you know, in, in his mm -hmm. gray uniform or whatever. Right. Um, and and on, on one side, you can sympathize, at least on that level. They, these, these were their sons the cream of their manhood going off and being slaughtered for this lost cause. <laughs> but it's a romanticized thing because just losers don't you the losing side in a war doesn't usually erect monuments to the fact that it lost. Right. Yeah, you, you hit on the answer to the second part of the question. The, the historical hypothetical historical equivalent would be Germany building monuments to Hitler, Himmler, 
Goebbels and, Go and, and whomever in about you know, 19, uh, 2000 to now. That would be outrageous and you know, incur enormous worldwide condemnation. But of course, the Civil uh, War wasn't as widespread as the World War, but still. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about the first. I was thinking about it. okay, the first part. I mean, of uh, the first part of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question I think is, what do they tell a black person? Yeah, it's celebrating their oppressors. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Our fine Southern monuments are acts of terrorism. They're a legitimization of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. They're a legitimization of the lynchings. They're a legitimization of violence toward Blacks. They tell Blacks that they don't belong, that this is not their culture. This is not their society, their acts of terrorism. In one sense, uh, their purpose was to hold that over their heads. You know, it's mm -hmm. just like a, another reminder, don't, don't get out of place because right. we, <laughs> uh might makes right right and you don't belong here yeah yeah good i should have seen that yeah you're right there's an excellent book by clint smith called how the word is passed which discusses um all these monuments to our oppressors um to include a large part of New York where they've simply just paved over the slave markets and the people who perished there and it's there's nothing there there's not a single thing there remembering mm -hmm. those people. Um, I, I recommend reading it I think it's really insightful yeah monuments to the oppressed are few and far between monuments to the oppressors are common. Are there mm -hmm. any other monuments in America whose construction is similarly oppressive? I think Custer's, Custer's Last Stand. Um, we yeah. toured it in the 90s and it very much celebrated mm -hmm. General Custer, it, how they were ambushed and right. <laughs> it was so horrific. But really, right. Yeah. That's a good, yeah, that's a really good example. The Alamo is another. Uh, the Alamo, I mean, they were fighting for freedom from Mexico, so freedom fighters. The issue that they were fighting for was slavery. Mexico was a democratic republic that was attempting to centralize and standardize the freedom of its citizens. And slavery was not part of those freedoms. So it wasn't about freedom, it was about slavery. Mm. Interesting. That's something that that yeah, I can understand it now thinking of, of the whole Mex Te Texas territory and so forth was was Mexico. But I know ne I never equated the defense of the Alamo as being tied up with with slavery. Yeah, it's, um, it's both an issue of slavery and an issue of being anti Mexican. Well, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. So sort of double racism. What about the Ten Commandments on courthouse lawns and steps? Yeah. Leave them. That's, in my opinion, at least, an act of Christian oppression. Yep, it is. It is. 
I mean, we we pri we pride. We have as a founding value that the that the government will not establish a, a religion. So government buildings like courthouses and so forth should not have monuments that favor one religion or any religion, any religion. Am I not right on that? And that's how, you know, but but you try to tell somebody that and then you're, you're anti-Christian, you're not, you know, you're not, um, mm -hmm. you don't love God, you don't love Jesus, so forth, so forth. It's, 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 yeah, I agree. But also, why are the Ten Commandments on inscribed on stone? Be because that's how it says in Genesis they were inscribed. <laughs> right. Why? Why are they? I mean, Exodus. Exodus. No. Right. Why are they inscribed on stone? Because they don't Genesis. change. <laughs> They're not changeable, right? No, oh. that's not why. Oh, okay. <laughs> where, where should God's law be inscribed? On your heart. On your heart. So what does the stone represent? Your stoned heart. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Heart of stone. Your heart of stone. That's exactly the point. So putting Ten Commandments on stone, in stone on courthouse steps, isn't Christian. It's anti-Christian. It's an attack on the gospel and on the church. You know, I never would have thought of it. I, I never visited where uh, Custer's Last Stand was, so I didn't know there was a like a monument to it. I do know the story of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, Chief Joseph and all. I don't know if there's any sort of monument to that. Um, well, you know what we've got, what we talked about earlier, um, somewhere along the line we talked about, it. yeah, the earlier part of this, all the missions along the California coast. I mean, they're there and nobody's going to take them down, but they, they are not really monuments to Christianity as much as they are monuments to enslaving indigenous people. Right. Almost enslaving them by baptizing them. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah. The missions. Yeah. And Sonoma General Vallejo's, um, what is it called? Hacienda is mostly still standing. It's one wing of it burned, um, but you know, it was you know, sort of a center of um, enormous oppression of indigenous peoples who were forced to work under really horrible conditions. And um, you know, if you tour it, that kind of element is barely mentioned, or actually it's only mentioned if in response to questions. Yeah, right, I can imagine. Not, you know, independently by, by, the, uh, by the tour guide. Mm. Our final question, we haven't you know, sort of completely, <clears throat> we haven't directly addressed the question, but in what ways were white Christian churches complicit with the racism of the post-Civil War period? The fact that there was segregation within the churches, if if, it were, if they were, if a church allowed black members, they had to sit separately. And possibly there were some churches that said, you can't, you have to go to your own church or something like that. And I mean, North and South. Mm -hmm. I, I went to an all-girls Catholic high school mm -hmm. in, um, from 1950 to 1954. And in my freshman class, there was a Black girl. Her name was Edna. I can't remember her last name, but then I can't remember the last names of most, most of the girls in my class. And she, she, um, 
the the people that were that I was drawn to were drawn to her. You know, was, you know, you always have little groups and stuff. And she was delightful and smart and everything. But sophomore year, she wasn't there anymore. And we, I think for a, a very little while, we talked among ourselves. I wonder why she didn't come back. But we were so clueless, <laughs> you know, growing up in the Maryland, Virginia area, D.C. area. Um, it never occurred to us that perhaps she didn't come back because A, she felt uncomfortable being the only black girl, or B, her family couldn't afford it. But if they couldn't afford it, they couldn't afford it. The first thing, she was probably on scholarship. But in my older days here now, I often think of her and wonder why. You know, and this was a good Catholic school with nuns and, and all that stuff. You'd think they, well, you know, you wouldn't, not in that era, but wouldn't it have been nice if it had been a primary purpose to have several people of color. We mm -hmm. did have girls of color. They were the daughters of diplomats from South American countries. So to my mind, that's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there, there's a sort of paradox of, Catherine Drexel was uh, supported um, the church pastored by Augustus Tolton. Mm. She also founded Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, which mm. focused on education for Blacks and indig Indigenous peoples, right. but didn't allow Blacks or indigenous peoples to become nuns. Really? And then oh. until the 1950s. Hmm. Uh, and then she also founded the only Catholic historically Black college or university, Loyola, Louisiana. Hmm. Uh, but, um, you know, a real kind of paradox and a real expression of of uh, the order's own racism that they would educate but not accept. Yeah, that's really, that is, I mean, I knew all everything else you said, but I didn't know that. That's disappointing. So we, we have segregation, we have, what, what else do we have? So they, probably, they weren't accepting Blacks into the seminaries either. And in fact, in fact, I expect there were very few religious orders or seminaries that ac accepted black people, which, which is why you have black congregations like the Oblates of, um, and it's, it's a woman's order and I can't think of the name, but it's Oblates of something and it is a black, black women's religious order. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they, would, they did what Catherine Drexel did, they, they wouldn't accept. Right. Right. Very much like historically black colleges and universities and uh, and and black churches. They're black not because they're blacks out of necessity rather than choice. That's right. It's not that whites can't attend, it's that blacks can't attend or feel excluded or are excluded from white institutions. Well, then in the sin of omission, right? The, the failure to speak out against racism and racist practices. Mm -hmm. Right. The sin of omission. The um, Going back to that statement from the Methodist Church South, I thought was was interesting, since in some ways it expresses a kind of right wing and racist critique that you know has persisted into our own time. So in some ways, you know, if we, we, we look at, you know, the institution of slavery 
for the period from slavery uh, to reconstruction, we see the construction of a narrative that has persisted in, to our own day. So we begin, first of all, with you know, a fundamental principle of slavery is that people are property and they have a measurable value as opposed to white people whose value is immeasurable. We, we discuss that as, as a, a kind of idolatry, which of course is a mortal sin. But so people of color continue to have a measurable value as opposed to white people who continue to have an immeasurable value. So, you know, for example, George Floyd's life, I mean, it's difficult to assign a precise value to it, but it was $19.99 or less. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery's life was of zero value. Many of the victims of uh, police murders are of zero value. So that element of slavery has persisted into the present day. The, the notion that uh, Blacks are lazy comes from the basic resistance of slave peoples against the work that they're forced to do. And that has become, you know, sort of a, a, a stereotype, mm. which is based on the slave period. Then also looking at the, the that Methodist statement. Um, so uh, a large portion, if not a majority of Northern Methodists have become incurably radical. <laughs> So, you know, we see today that uh, those who aren't right wing are communists and socialists and Marxists. Critical race theory is Marxist. Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, and whomever, Chuck Schirmer, are either communists or socialists. Uh, the Democratic Party is socialistic that's kind of a you know constant has become a constant narrative yeah. uh, with the problem of course being that none of these people know what communism socialism or marxism are but no matter um they teach for doctrine the commandments of men that's become a common critique yeah. It's being used, it's been used to my hearing by a pastor of a local church who stood up and said that even in our own church, we have this, this going on, men preaching evil instead of good. And he named Bishop Kupich and Father James Martin S.J. as preaching what the culture taught and not what God taught. And he was talking about being inclusive about LBGQ, you know, people. Okay. Right. I could not believe my ears. He says in a homily uh -huh. in the middle of mass. Right. Wow. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's a common, that's a common uh, conservative refrain. I mean, you, you hear it all the time <coughs> also in evangelical churches and it was a major part of the, the conservative catholic critique against Laudato, of Laudato C. they have gone on to impose conditions upon discipleship that christ did not impose that's a common refrain and and if we read the missionary discourse in chapter 10 of St. Matthew's Gospel, we find that, and these are people, particularly among our separated brethren, who are supposed to believe, you know, every word is literally true and all that other garbage. Mm -hmm. 
we read the we read the missionary discourse christ imposed some rather strenuous conditions on discipleship he didn't say you have to let me into your heart he said that you have to carry your cross and in part he meant that literally but he also meant it figuratively which is to say you have to die to yourself which is essential to love one's neighbor exactly. and so and that has uh, taken on a different meaning their pulpits are perverted to agitations and questions not helpful to personal piety but promote a political and ecclesiastical discord preach christ and him crucified do not preach politics so personal piety and that's very much you know a part of so the sole focus is on the theology of salvation and that you know is true in catholicism especially conservative catholicism Yep. Today, the focus is on my personal salvation. But one's personal salvation is only part of the gospel message and only a small part of the gospel message and only a small part of the biblical message and only a small part of the New Testament message. Chapter 21 of Revelation talks about the new heaven and the new earth. That's very much unrelated in many ways to personal salvation. I had a pastor once who used to, in many times in his homilies, would emphasize the fact that we are saved as a people it's not individual salvation we are the body of christ and we are saved as a people right when we gather for mass we are the body of christ gathered from mass not just me and jesus right exactly yeah. exactly right um we are almost out of time just one final comment thought about you know, what you just said mary that that's really expressed extremely well in chapter 12 of Romans that we're one people of God and yet that's the chapter that uh, you know in the kind of altar that had an American flag in the Bible open to chapter 12 of Romans that's right. that <laughs> used to inaugurate the second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I meant to go look and read Romans through all together because I couldn't imagine why they would have that, you know, when, when I read it in the chapter here. I'll have to go read Romans all the way through. You can only find it relevant if you bring to it a fundamentally racist mindset. Okay. So then, you know, where one people speaks of, you know, the brotherhood, of, you know, us white oh, people. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. But wow. that's, that's putting your personal touch. That's it. obviously, you know, diametrically opposed to the clear meaning of the text. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. You know, whether you interpret it literally or not, it doesn't really matter. It's completely diametrically opposed to any possible logical meaning of the text. Next week, we'll do chapter seven, which is about the complicity of the North. So fundamentally, as Northerners, we're not left off the hook. Mm -hmm. 